world's a treasure. It's been telling us to leave for a while now. Here we go. Hang on. Make it count. You might have to decide between seeing your children again and the future of the human race. We'll find a way. But we always have. Lee Smith has edited such brilliant films as The Truman Show, Fearless, and Master and Commander. But he is perhaps best known for his work with Christopher Nolan on Inception, The Prestige, and the Batman trilogy. His most recent collaboration with Nolan is on the mind-blowing film Interstellar. Lee, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's a real pleasure. You're welcome. So, Lee, how did you first get involved in uh, film editing? My father was an optical effects supervisor in Australia, and he, my father phoned all of the people that he was working with and a small post-production company said, yeah, we need a kid, basically. And I started work at this small company called Film Production Services in Australia. And guess who worked there as uh, directors? Peter Weir, Philip Noyce, Jane Campion, Gillian Armstrong. So unwittingly, I'd landed in this amazing facility and I kind of wanted to know how to do everything. And some of the other assistants weren't interested. They wanted to be film assistants, mm -hmm. didn't want to know how to operate the projectors, didn't want to know how to operate a Nagra or the transfer bay. And then when the industry contracted again, guess who was kept on? <laughs> me. <laughs> the lesson in that is you should be interested in all facets. You it's, never know what's going to pan You out. never know. And then I became a sound editor and a sound designer. And well, you designed the sound on Deadcom, which is sonically such yeah, an amazing yeah. film. It was one of my favorite jobs. And it was one of the few times where you, you, you kind of worked on a bigger budget film where kind of any idea I had of doing something, there was no resistance. It was mm. like, sure, go hire a yacht. I was like, wow, <laughs> okay, thanks. And, uh, and I did sound for Jane Campion's piano and then I was working with Peter Weir as uh, an assistant film editor and I worked my way up through the ranks to be co-editor on The Truman Show and then I cut Master and Commander and The Way Back. And then how did you and Christopher Nolan uh, first end up working together? I just finished Master and Commander and we were finished in LA and I had an agent and she rang up and, and said, you know, would I be interested in editing a Batman movie? To which I said, no. Uh, <laughs> and then she was saying that this director is every, he's a bit of a, a lot of buzz about him. And um, had I seen Memento, of course, I said, no. Only person <laughs> on the planet who hadn't seen Memento. So I went out and watched Memento and then I rang her back and I said, yeah, I mean, clearly this guy really makes great films. Mm -hmm. And um, so, sure, and I went over and had a, an interview, and um, which was fascinating because we didn't talk about Batman at all. It was just like we're doing, just chatting about films and experience and movies. And Well, I find that, you know, being in the editing room for so many hours with the director, it, you really have to feel comfortable with that Absolutely. person. It's more than just the technical, and you really have to see if you're in sync emotionally and whether... You know, you have a very similar yeah. sensibility. I honestly can't imagine uh, being in a room with someone for that many hours and that much work if you didn't have a synchronicity of ideas. So I loved Interstellar. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was brilliant. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Can you imagine if you'd have said you had yeah, it? Yeah, I, mean, I know. The exactly. interview's over. So you shot on 70 millimeter. Does that affect how you edit? Do you hold on shots longer? No, or? because we did a very exhaustive process on The Dark Knight when we shot, a lot of The Dark Knight was shot in IMAX, 70 millimeter. And I did cutting tests with the aspect ratios. And I remember the first time I did it and I'm watching it on my monitor in the editing room and I'm like, oh, this is shit. This isn't gonna work. Because the frame was just so big. and Well, you got the frame the 235 aspect ratio and then popping out to IMAX and popping down again. Mm. And on a monitor, it does not work. 
as an aspect ratio change. And I took it over to IMAX and we projected it. And I was completely shocked. It was like, wow. It, you're not, because of the, the scope and the size of the image, you're no longer aware of the aspect ratio changing. And in the Avid, I've got a um, full frame 4-3 uh, aspect ratio of everything shot in IMAX on one layer, then we'll take a, a extraction, like I'll run a 235 mask over the top of it so we can look down from the top and we see the 235. Ooh, and yes. my, yeah, jump just up to flip. the different video layers. Yeah, and I just carry the IMAX lock to the 235 extraction. And, and that was all worked out by my assistant editor, John Lee, who is a genius. <laughs> And I've worked with him for about 17 years now, and he's fantastic at getting these films that are very, very complex in their pipeline. Well, I find it so important to have an assistant who really knows that stuff mm. because you really want to just focus on the emotion and the scenes and yeah. getting that. And if yeah. you're if you're thinking too much about, you know, the technology and things like that, no, it, it, no, it, I, it, I I completely agree. And, and you on these films, you know, you've got a big crew. We've got conforming crew. We've got because we're on film, mm. and we're digitizing and we're cutting digitally, and we're we're transferring files backwards and forwards to the UK for the visual effects, and we're watching things on cine sync sessions and everything. The world of the assistant editor is so technical now. The knowledge that these guys have to have is compared to what I used to have to have as a film assistant is, is no comparison. You really appreciate them. And as you say, is I, I need to not worry about all that stuff because it, this is complicated enough. Speaking of visual effects, I heard that there wasn't much screen screen and that a lot of it was back projection plates and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Did you cut the back projection plates or how, how did that no. all work? No, the back projection, uh, the rear projection and front projection was worked out in pre-production and Paul Franklin and his team conjured up a lot of the space. There's a lot of stuff in the movie that is rear projection and front projection and there wasn't anything to cut because basically what they would do is run sequences like approaching the wormhole and going through the wormhole was just one big slab on the projector mm. and they'd just back it up and run it and then the actors would go, you know, they'd see the ring coming and what it gave the actors is this amazing feeling that they, it was real. When I went inside some of these spaceships that they built and they're on gimbals and you sit, you're looking out windows at high definition space, it's freaky. So you, you really felt that you were in it. And do you feel that that helps you as an editor because the performances are more oh, real? and awesomely. I'm not cutting with green screens. Sure, not every shot was complete, but it was between, say, 50 and 80% complete. It's like these shots you're looking at here. Iceland is up to the horizon, and then they inverted Iceland, took out all the green that was in the background. But the shot itself was still otherworldly to begin with. Mm. But... Again, this would be a guy walking on a green screen stage with someone blowing soap suds at him. Yeah. Even the Tesseract sequence, McConaughey was hanging on wires, of course, but all of the timelines were being digitally projected. But again, just from a cutting standpoint, I could see what it was that I was doing. So the movie starts with some interviews, and I heard that they were actual people who had lived through the Dust Bowl storms. What was the choice to... Chris gave me the Dust Bowl documentaries because if you imagine the time of the Dust Bowl, the people who lived through it, this was apocalyptic. This felt like the end of days, like these dust storms were ruining their crops. You couldn't breathe, it burned your eyes. And you would be forgiven for thinking that this was a similar thing. This is like the land just saying, enough's enough. Mm -hmm. And some of the interviews, you know, the people who were quite religious were sort of saying it's a sign from God. You know, we're, we're at the end now. This is the end of us. And I think Chris wanted to use those faces and those people who lived through it and uh, give the film like the same feeling of like the earth is just basically telling us time's up. Well, I find that the opening, the first maybe 10 minutes, it almost felt like you, you went with a slower pace to sort of show that there was this feeling of like dread and hardship and there was very little technology. 
I think the pace of the film was something we worked out for a long time and we tried a couple of times to pack stuff down, especially McConaughey. As you pack it down, it lost everything. It, like, completely started to fall over in the meaning of the lines and everything. And, I mean, I've, I mean, we've had success on the Batman movies in packing the dialogue down. And you would think, why not, could do it with this. It didn't work. It didn't work at all. The movie itself was just basically telling you it's just not going to do this. And I think it might be something to do with McConaughey's performance of thoughtful dialogue, but we quickly realised that you would damage it if you started going down, so you had to let it breathe. And it's hard leaving everything, my kids, your father. We're going to be spending a lot of time together. We should learn to talk. Emma, not to. Just being honest. I don't think you need to be that honest. They say, you know, wow, I mean, I know it was almost three hours, but it didn't feel like three hours. Well, I felt it could almost have been even longer because there's just so much yeah. information, so much yeah. story that's that's in that yeah. three hours. And again, that's... It's such an epic piece. The whole thing with editing and pace is, I believe, is you want to make a movie long enough to make them want more, not long enough for anyone to say it's boring or dull or I was like... I mean, sure, if you don't like the movie, there's nothing you can do about that. Well, I also feel like if you don't understand the characters, then it feels even longer. Like, yeah. if it's all plot, it no, feels absolutely. longer. I mean, it's like, you know, the classic big action movie where someone dies and you're like, eh. It's like, who cares? If you don't... If you're not vested, McConaughey's relationship with his daughter is so strong. That just pulls you through the whole movie and his love of getting back to his daughter is completely understandable. I'm coming back. Another reason I think the movie works so well at that length is that it's just this enormous journey of someone going and coming all the way back. Well, how do you keep something intimate when it has such a huge scale, such a large canvas? I think it's just spending the right amount of time with each of those intimate moments. And it's, for example, the sequence where McConaughey goes to the water planet and they get into trouble on the water planet and he's very upset with Bran that she's made a mess of it. They've lost time. And that horrible moment for McConaughey where he realises that he's missed his daughter's entire growing up or his children, his... So he goes and sits with the playback machine and we, we stay on McConaughey nice. for a very long time. And, which is not conventional. Conventional wisdom would be you'd be milking it backwards uh -huh. and forwards because they're equally as good on the screen. It's funny. But McConaughey in take one of that, because he, here's the thing, he hadn't seen what was on the screen. Mm. He'd read the script, of course, but he hadn't seen the playback material. So when he sat down... I'd edited, pre-edited the playback material. So when they push the button, that stuff comes up. And and I think that's the most amazing moment. <laughs> it's just McConaughey just like, holy shit. You know, he just goes for it. That's all one time. And he wasn't rehearsed ahead of time. That no, was him seeing it see for it, the first time. Didn't want to see it. Wow. And so he had that immediate profound reaction and, uh, you know, I mean, I cannot rate this guy more highly. And His performance is it's just genius. He's so smart because, and again, from an editing standpoint, drawing it back to editing, he unscriptedly would give context to every screen. He'd like he'd narrate each scene inside the ship. Now, you don't use all of it, but some of it was amazingly helpful because it's not scripted but he would sort of just talk his way through the scene and the other actors are all listening to him. It's like I'm the captain of a ship and uh -huh. a lot of that dialogue is in the movie. And, it's, and it wasn't scripted. No, and it's complete. And it's what it is is showing that McConaughey had a complete, and I mean complete, understanding of every sequence in that film. I was just, in dailies, we were just going, this is awesome. I mean, well, it helps too because, I mean... Well, it helps me. For, for editing, <laughs> yeah. it must have been hard to be like, okay, we have these very complex astrophysical 
things where we have to explain wormholes and bending of, of light and black holes and mm. time. How did you approach those scenes so that it was clear and you weren't losing the audience, but kept it moving so that people didn't get bored like they were being yeah. lectured to? Well, again, it's, it's just, it's all about pace and rhythm. And there's a lot of, you know, heavy duty work that you've got to go through. There's a lot of dialogue. And as you say, you know, there's a lot of theoretical physics and, and, you know, there was always a little bit worrying that we'd suddenly hit this and the movie would go, oh, you know, because it's just like astronauts sitting around chatting. But what they're chatting about is big. So you quickly realise you can't eliminate it because it's all, Chris writes a very, so carefully interwoven dialogue that, you know, people might at first blush go, oh, yeah, you could shorten half of that could come out. It's like, I kid you not, you can't. It's because dense. those lines all play into the next sequence and there's like three reasons for everyone to say anything. The thing is if you can get them in, like get the audience to engage with these characters and believe in their journey and believe in the stakes, then those scenes can work at that length. This was more profound. At the end of the movie, people were kind of almost couldn't talk. Well, the movie stays with you. Yeah, I think Chris was going for was this is an experience. It's it's not just a movie. This it's an is Odyssey. like a, this is a, <laughs> yeah. This is why you go to the cinema. Speaking of the scene where Matthew McConaughey sort of breaks down, where Coop just mm. falls apart, I really liked how you then went through the TV and revealed Earth. It was such a nice way yeah. to connect space to Earth. I, I think from the from the scripting, it just the scene ends and the next scene is Earth. Chris would always start with them reaching and sitting back. As you, you know, like he's good at a great gift for an editor is Chris doesn't shortchange you on the intros and out, mm -hmm. even if Gives he thinks you're not going to use them. He shoots them anyway. And I've worked with some directors who don't, and it's really frustrating because. Yeah, you get rid of 90% of them, but oh, wow, they work when they work. And that one was just oh, the first time we did it. And we're, we're like, now that's a cut. Mm -hmm. That was one of my, I'm glad you mentioned that. It was one of my favorite cuts in the movie. It was just, just, great. just, just the screen goes dead and Jessica Chastain sits back and you're like, holy hell, <laughs> now we're on Earth. Yeah. That was a beautiful transition. Another scene that I just thought was beautifully cut was... When he's driving away, Murph won't speak to him, and then right. she decides she's going to speak to him, runs after the truck. And McConaughey was just, the look on his face was devastating. And you hear, instead of actually going to the spaceship, you hear 10, yeah. 9. That's a very long 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. And I accelerated it cheekily towards the end. When they were shooting it, Chris said, you know, lock a camera to the side of the truck which is completely NASA. So hearing that, watching the dust bloom behind him, and then just cutting to the rockets bursting, it was really cool. Talk about a little bit of the challenges of keeping things exciting when people are sort of locked in like helmets mm. and they're locked into seats and they can't move very fast if you have an action scene. So yeah. it's all sort of almost in slow motion when, when there's like that fight on the yeah. ice planet. I think it's just utilizing some of the angles. I mean, some of the some of the really tight stuff in the uh, rocket launch was much more interesting than the looser footage, because the the uh, they had all these vibration machines under the seats, so the actors were literally vibrating. And I just found the intimacy of being in really tight, looking at how terrified they were. And we looked at NASA footage, you know, there's a lot of research done. I looked and listened uh, to a lot of NASA footage of takeoffs as to what is the reality of these takeoffs. And uh, a lot of the sound that's in that takeoff is built from the real deal. And then you go to silence, which was such a nice transition sound-wise. Yeah. Was, the, was it silent or was there, did you have no, some sort of... No, completely and utterly silent. And yeah, it, again, I've never done that before. I don't know. They always told us there was, you can't go to complete silence. And yeah, no, I've been told that. Like, yeah, yeah. You can't do silent. Can't go, no. but, but the fact that it was totally silent no, there's not was even, very intense there's, there's, because you're not used to it. No, there's nothing. It is... It was, uh, and and we, we looked at overlaps and we tried all these interesting things while we were cutting about reverbing out. Uh, of noise into silence as if there's like an echo 
you know, and then we just realised, no, just got to cut that sucker dead. And it's really confronting mm -hmm. when you go from... Well, well it's so loud too because yeah. the rot... The, the and you just off. go, boom, you're in space. Chris kept saying, he said, that's what I want. I want it to look like this is real. Well, the docking sequence reminded me very much of disassembling HAL from right. 2001, yes. which was very sort of locked off. Yeah, and, exactly. But it gave it a very tense feeling because you almost wanted something that was moving to give you a sense like, yeah. oh, it's okay. And the whole idea behind that scene was to keep it tense because it can't look easy. Because, you know, with a lot of science fiction films now, you see the ship go, Woo! and again, the, a lot of the NASA documentaries were studied about how the things lock into place. And it's very elaborate and the balaic, but kind of nothing's guaranteed. You know, it's not all simple. I mean, space is not safe. Well, the thing that was also nice was that scene had a very different feel for then the next scene where everything's spinning out of control and yeah. very chaotic. That was happening. a piece of physics right there. And was that mostly models? That uh, a combination of models and CG and practical. Um, there was an enormous amount of model shoot on this film because the models, again, had a very tactile real feel. With all of the organic inconsistencies of when you shoot, that's why everything starts to match in because, you know, you're lighting a model. You know, the cameras are not always perfect. You know, there's a bit of chatter or the, the, the motion control rig wasn't quite stable or the, or the model itself flexed. It was interesting. It was all the physical nature of things that make things not perfect, which makes them believable. We, we track uh, rumbles from handheld shots or rumbles from rigs where the frame's just jittering off of a real shot and then apply it to the CG shot. And mm. it's amazing. As soon as you do it, suddenly, wow. Interesting. It's Can't, almost imperceptible, but yeah. you feel it. Every imperfection known can be applied to CG. And the more you apply it, the more now I believe it because otherwise it's just a cartoon. It just doesn't, sure. doesn't look right. Uh, I really love that one scene where we heard Michael Caine saying, do not go gently into I thought that was so cool. I thought that was <laughs> yeah. just Send wonderful. Him off. Yeah, do not go gentle into that good night and you just see it go to black. Mm -hmm. There's something about the loneliness of that that was captured so beautifully. And then going into the cryosleep, into that bath of I don't know what. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there, it's interesting because the film's got very poetic sequences, very intense action sequences, very like epic sequences. Trying to balance all those sort of tones. Tell me a little bit about all yeah. that. Again, it was just in the rhythm and the pace of the film is where the movie needed that next action kicker. But it was gratifying to know that we had those moments because just when you think, I don't want another dialogue sequence, something would happen. And I think in other movies where maybe the scenes are a bit more modular or, or scenes that you can pull out or drop or cut in half, that is what you're always looking for is that, you know, that feeling when you're watching a movie and you've just had this very long dialogue scene and then you cut and it's like, oh, no, they're going to go, they're going to go again. <laughs> and it's like, please, mm -hmm. somebody blow something up. The film does tend to speak for itself because, like I said, when we trimmed it, it was pretty amazing how quickly it would suddenly become less. Well, there's so much complexity. I mean, you're dealing with present, past, mm. five dimensions. You're dealing with, you know, earth and space and intercutting all these. I mean, we were pretty hard on making sure that there was just nothing that would derail the movie. We did lift some of the dialogue because Chris does you know, be, he's very careful to keep writing and writing and writing because he sort of, he's almost um, building in a, an armory against someone, you know, saying, but I didn't get it. You just carefully keep plucking it out, screen it again. And if the problem doesn't arise, then you can leave it out. Sure. But you've also got to be ready to put it back in again. It's just good writing, good storytelling and, and an, an emotional connection to the characters that lets you you know, sail through that journey. I really enjoyed watching it. Great, great. Yeah. Go see it again. I will. Thank you very much. See you.